Please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. Last week we had a look at Matthew chapter 20 for the laborers in the vineyard. And we saw the goodness of the master of the vineyard in paying those who had started early in the morning and those who had only finished an hour's of worth of work and bless them with a full day's wage. And so that lesson we've learned there was the goodness of the master of the vineyard. Now this evening we come to chapter 21, where we see a parable told by Jesus of two sons, verses 28 to 32, and then another parable about the tenants of the vineyard, verse 33, up until the end of that chapter, and then again a third parable Chapter 22, Parable of the Wedding Feast. Now before I open up the parable of the two sons this evening, I would like to read for us the whole chapter, chapter 21, where we see Jesus entering Jerusalem, the triumphal entry on the back of a donkey. Then we see his first action in Jerusalem is to cleanse the temple. And then he curses the fig tree. And after he has done these two signs in Jerusalem, We see the scribes and the Pharisees challenging his authority. And it's based on this challenge of the scribes and the Pharisee that he tells the following three parables. So to get the message of the three parables being told, we need to see the context in which they are told. And so we need to see the events leading up to his authority being challenged. So let's read from verse 1 of chapter 20, 21. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olive, when Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying say to the daughter of Zion behold your king is coming to you humbled and mounted on a donkey and on a colt the foul the foal of a beast of burden the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and he said sat on them most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road And others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of Man, to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables, the money changers, and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, And the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry and seeing a fig fig tree by the wayside he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves and he said to it may no fruit ever come from you again and the fig tree withered at once when the disciples saw it they marveled saying how did the fig tree wither at once and Jesus answered them truly I say to you if you have faith and do not doubt you will not only do what has been done to this fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. 
And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it amongst themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all, all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two sons did the will of his father? They said, the first. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenant to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat, fat calves, and have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off. One, of it, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main road and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. 
May the Lord bless the reading of his word. And so after these things, the Pharisees and the scribes were very angry with Jesus and they sought ways to kill him. For he had dared to speak up against them. They who are the established religious leaders have come to Jesus challenging his authority because of the signs that he did in Jerusalem. The first one in cleansing the temple and the second one a private miracle uh, with a fig tree in preparation to go to the temple for his day of teaching in the temple. So what happens in this chapter happens over two days. The first day he goes in, he cleanses out the temple. For the scribes and the Pharisees and the money changers were sitting in the temple and selling the animals needed for the slaughter. And so the Lord overthrew their t tables because they were profiting of the need of the people. You see, the Lord had commanded them to bring sacrifices and offering to the temple for their sins. And so what the religious leaders did and these money changers did is they sold the sacrifice at the temple. And most probably they made lots of money off of God's people, sold for a great profit these sacrifices. But it could also be that they were providing for those who have sinned and needing to bring offerings and sacrifices to the Lord, an easy way out. If you needed to bring a sacrifice to the Lord from your flock, you needed to go through great trouble to buy that animal and bring it to the temple. But now it's a quick and easy like a vending machine. You just need to bring your money, put your money into the vending machine and get your sacrifice. No matter the circumstances here, and I don't think we'll know it fully or exact, but the point being that it was easy for the people to do this. They weren't respecting the temple and that this was the house of God. Another thing, Jesus comes into the temple. And as we know from the Old Testament, many times when God would meet with his people, his glory would descend on the temple or the tabernacle. And so that he would be visible and be seen and be experienced by his people. A sign of him dwelling with his people. And here Christ in the flesh comes to the temple. God in his glory veiled in human flesh comes to the temple. And here is what he has to do first and foremost. Driving out those who would make stumbling block for those who truly want to worship the Lord. And so Christ who is the stumbling block of those who do not have faith removing the stumbling block of those who have true faith, removing the money changers and driving them out. And now because of these two things, because of Jesus cleansing the temple and returning the next day to teach in the temple, the scribes and the Pharisees come to him in, chap in chapter 21 and verse 23. They come to him and ask him, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? And so Jesus challenges that question with another question. He says, I'll ask you a question and then I'll answer you if you can answer me. And Jesus asks the baptism of John from where did it come? From heaven or from man? And that challenge he directs at them is indirectly asking them the question, would you even recognize the authority by which I do these things if I tell you by which authority I do them? For can you recognize the authority by which John was baptizing? The calling of John, the prophet. Did his calling come from heaven or from man? Was he sent into the wilderness to proclaim his message? Was he sent by heaven or was he sent by a man? And so they discussed it amongst themselves. You know, if we say from heaven, we must believe him. And John had said, Christ is the son of God who takes away the sins of the world. John had confessed him to be the Messiah, the one who would be, be sent to die on the cross. Yet they were afraid of the people to deny to outright deny that he did this by the authority of heaven. Verse 26, if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowds, for they also hold that John was a great prophet. 
And so twice in the reading of Scripture this evening, we see the scribes and the Pharisee being fearful of the crowds, fearful of the people, first because of what they would do or say about John the prophet, and then secondly, of what they would say about Jesus the prophet. We'll come to that in a moment. And so they claim, we do not know. We do not know. And it's a shameful thing when religious leaders, knowing the truth, deny, deny that they know the truth. It seems to us that they might be humble in claiming we do not know. If you didn't know the discussion that goes on amongst them, this might just look like a pastor saying to you, well, I don't know, or an elder, I don't know. Now, that might sound very humble. But if you hold up the truth of God's word, and say, well, this is what God's word is saying. Do you not know? For this is the challenge that Jesus issues time and time again. We see him issuing that challenge here to the scribes and the Pharisees in this happening. Have you not read the scriptures? Do you not know these things? And so he said to them, verse 27, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And then he starts telling them parables. The first one is about two sons. Now, we know the nature of the parables and the purpose for which the parables were told in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus giving an answer to his disciples. The parables are given so that because they would know the secrets of heaven, but to those outside, the secrets have not been given. And so the parables have these have this dual function. First of all, to reveal the secrets of heaven to God's people and to hide the secret of the kingdom to those who are outside. And so these parables, particularly the one about the two sons and the one about the tenants in the vineyard, are mirror images of the kind that reveal the secrets of heaven. For here, we find one of the sons and even the application of this parable, Jesus saying, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Jesus now boldly proclaims to them that the sinners and tax collectors will know the secrets of the kingdom before you know them. Revealing to them that the secrets of the kingdom are hidden from them. And again with a parable of the tenants, he utters the same words to them. Verse 43 Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And so Jesus is outright telling them with these parables that they will be outside of the kingdom of God. They will not partake of the kingdom. And the way in which Jesus shows this to them is by inviting them to answer questions about these parables and this evening we'll only look at the parable of the two sons he invites them in the first place verse 28 what do you think it's the same as introducing the question the baptism of john from where did it come so he's interrogating them jesus was flipping the situation on its head they thought that they would interrogate jesus and catch him in his words and Jesus, by asking them questions, caught them in their words and in their hearts and thinking. Proving to themselves and to those around what's going on in their hearts. So what do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first son and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And so this is the first son. No. I won't do it. And then without another word, he goes out and he completes the will of his father. And he does what was commanded of him. And then secondly, another son, verse 30. The father goes to the second son and he said to him the same thing. And that son answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. And so the question is put before the scribes and the Pharisees. Which one of the two did the will of his father? Obviously, the first one did it. He said no, 
But he did the will of his father. And the first one said, yes, I'll do the will of my father. And he doesn't do it. So obviously it must be the first son. It's such an easy question to answer. It's obvious. And by the obvious answer, they said, the first. And then Jesus responded to them, showing them that by nature they know this. Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness. Verse 32, tying the things back to their questioning of him and him questioning them about John and them cla claiming not to know. He says, you know, for the Father has come to you. The Father has come to you. And you have said, I go, sir. You have put up your hand. Verse 32, for John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. You are like the second son putting up your hand for service saying, I will do the will of the father and then refuse to do so. For you know, you know. And even when you saw it adding up to their guilt, even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. You had an opportunity to repent and you did not repent. You did not repent and believe him. And so Jesus is not letting them escape with that answer. Not letting them escape by claiming not to know the truth. Jesus is showing them that they are culpable. That they are responsible to know these things. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3. We see in John chapter 3, a man with the name of Nicodemus, a Pharisee, also coming to Jesus. Verse 9 of chapter 3, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? The point being that Jesus asked Nicodemus this pointed question. Are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Chapter 21 of Matthew, the scribes and the Pharisees have made themselves fools in front of the crowds by claiming we do not know. Simple question that Jesus asks them. The baptism of John, is it from heaven or is it from man? And they say, we do not know. And Jesus proving to them and to the crowds, you should know. It's shameful that you claim that you don't know. And he heaps on them judgment upon judgment in the parables. For we know the purpose for which the parables were given was to show those who are of the kingdom, the secrets of the kingdom, and to those outside, the kingdom will be shut. And so Jesus is shutting the door of the kingdom on the scribes and the Pharisees through the, through the preaching of the, of the parables. And so what we find here is in the same parable, in the same proclamation of God's truth, we find two reactions. So at every parable we come to this point, there are those who know the secrets of heaven and those for whom the secrets of heaven are shut. And it's through the preaching of the word, it's through the preaching of the parables that Jesus reveals to us. And here's the application for you and for me again. We've said this over the, the weeks. If we listen to the parables, what is our heart and our attitude toward Jesus in, in the parables? 
Do we exhibit the same characteristics as the scribes and the Pharisees? To a certain extent, we sometimes do. We are sometimes challenged by the parables, challenged by their teaching because there are some things happening in them that we think are strange and wonderful. But in this very straightforward parable this evening, we are shown the door is shut to those who claim to be of Christ and who do not know his word and do not respond to his word. So when we encounter the preaching of the word, particularly in the parables, we've said it, Jesus whispers in the parables. He's boldly proclaimed the truth of the coming kingdom, but he also reveals the minor details of the kingdom through the telling of the parables and showing us what the kingdom of heaven is like. And so the question becomes, do you want to know? Do you want to know? For if you want to know, you need to pray and be humble before the Lord and ask him to help you to open your eyes, to open your ears, to open your heart to receive the secrets of the kingdom and to turn and to be changed by the preaching of the word. For this is the focus of this parable of the two sons. The first son had a change of heart after declaring, I will not, I will not. Outwardly proclaiming that he will not side with his father, that he will not do the work that his father has called him to. But afterwards he goes. And the response of the second, boldly proclaiming, I will, I will do this. But then not moving a muscle to be obedient to the Father. And so this evening the application for you and for me is that we need to be like that first son. We don't need to say no at first. We don't have to say no at first. It's not the point of the parable. The point is you need to render service to God if you are called to that service. And so no matter what you say, yes I will or no I won't, the true test of your obedience does not come with you proclaiming your obedience, yes I will or no I won't, but in you taking up the cause to which you were called to render that service to God. You see, for even that second son who says I go and has not yet gone is given opportunity. In the end, Jesus says to them, even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. You still had opportunity to go and do what you said you would do. And so this is the grace of God coming to us in the parables. Not just in the parables, but in our everyday life. Every time the sun rises, God gives you another opportunity to repent. Every breath that you have, God gives you another opportunity to repent and to render service unto the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so humble yourselves before him. Humble yourselves before him and lay hold of Christ by faith in hope and render the service of love. May the Lord help us to do so and to cling to him. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you reveal yourself to us. Lord, and we acknowledge this evening the dual nature of your word. Your word is a two-edged sword. A word that pierces our hearts. For some it will be a piercing to life. And for some judgment in death. And we see that in the response to your word and in the preaching of your word. That those whom you have called and have chosen will receive blessing and step into your kingdom. But those who harden themselves will be cast away into outer darkness. And as we have heard this morning, O Lord, by your justice 
that is good and right. For the world does not operate according to the justice of a mere man, but of the creator God who made all things for himself. And so we thank you, Lord, that you did not forsake your creation when we sinned against you and when we continue to sin against you. But that you come in your holiness and in your glory proclaiming the message of the kingdom to come. We thank you for your prophets of old, all of the prophets in the Old Testament. We thank you for their service and their word to us. But we know, Lord, that Christ is the ultimate prophet, the final prophet through whom you have spoken your word. Let us take heed to his word and see the message of all the other prophets in light of the proclamation of Christ and the revelation of Christ, the prophet of prophets, the priest of priests, and the king of kings. May we lay hold of him in the fullness in which you have given him to us. Grant us the faith needed to respond to him as our prophet. Grant us the hope needed to respond to him as our priest and grant us the love to respond to him as king and so embrace the fullness of Christ and his offices, the fullness of the salvation which you have purchased for us so that we may lead a full and happy Christian life even amidst the sufferings of this world so that we might stand as faithful servants and may render happy obedience to you. And so, Lord, we pray that as we hear your call day by day in which you have called us to be obedient, to worship, to love, and to serve you, each in his own way and capacity with the gifts that you have created us, we pray that we would do so, not begrudgingly, but in the sincere love of a son which was adopted and will share in the full blessings to come through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, therefore, that you forgive us our sins and that you cleanse us of all unrighteousness. For yours is the kingdom and the glory and the power forevermore. Amen. Let's now stand and sing our closing hymn.